dickheads, this pink laser beam of truth is beaming to you from our self-isolated bunkers uh, during the coronavirus. That's why we're not in the studio. We have a special guest tonight, uh, Betsy Wolheim, daughter of Don Wolheim, and also the person who runs Daw, uh, Daw Publishing today. And uh, it's really exciting for us because Don Wolheim is one of the names that you hear most on this podcast. As he published almost all of the early Philip K. Dick works. Welcome, Betsy, to the Dickheads podcast. Hi. Hi, Dickheads. Howdy. <laughs> uh, we're really excited to have you, and we're going to talk today about this is a tribute episode to your father, so we really want to dig deep into his life, his career, and everything that he meant towards the science fiction genre. And I think it's safe to say that he is one of the founding fathers of the genre, the modern genre as we know it. How much can you tell us about your father's childhood? Because he had a really interesting childhood. Um, I can tell you a lot about my father's childhood. Uh, what specifically do, would you like to know? Well, I think there's a lot, from what I've read, it seems like his childhood really influenced how he became, like, a, you know, interested in the fantastic. He had a really not exceptionally normal childhood <laughs> because of your grandfather and the situation that, um, that Don and his sister grew up in. Tell us more well, about you, that. you said exceptionally normal because your 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 audio cut out. I think you were saying abnormal. Yeah, no, not I, not yeah, exceptionally. Came across as normal because your your audio just cut out. Um, Sorry about that. My dad uh, grew up. My my the Walheim family has been in the country since before the Civil War, so I'm a fourth generation New Yorker. My father was born, was de was delivered by his father, who was a doctor. He was born on, in his parents' court grounds on an 81st in New York. He was an Upper East Side kid. And um, my grandfather was a doctor who graduated from um, Columbia Medical School in 1903, which was a terrifying medical era. Um, it was an era when uh, surgeons basically operated to, and then killed someone, operated on somebody else and then killed someone. And they just kept killing people until they found out what worked. And um, my grandfather uh, practiced out of his home, and he was a urologist who specialized in venereal disease. Mm. <laughs> so it was, this was the time when uh, gonorrhea and syphilis were prevalent and incurable. So in a brownstone, I don't know if how many people are familiar with the layouts of brownstone. In a brownstone <laughs> building, you have to go through the entire floor to get to the floor above. So um, my grandfather's offices were on the second floor of the house. Uh, their living room, et cetera, was on the first, and their bedrooms were on the third, and the fourth floor was empty because there was too much space, if you can imagine that in Manhattan. <laughs> um, that's how big the house was. And my my father and his sister, who was two years older than he was, had to walk through the medical offices of their father to get to their bedrooms. And my grandfather was just terrified that his children, Eleanor and Donald, would touch a wet doorknob, put their hands to their mouth, and get gonorrhea out of the mouth, which is incurable. Um, so he really put the fear of God into, my, into, into, into his kids' uh, I use that phrase loosely because my grandfather was an atheist, my father was an atheist, I'm an atheist, my kids are atheists, we're a family of atheists, very secular, uh, although Jewish, um, <laughs> secular, secular Jewish. Um, and uh, my father never kissed anyone his entire life, not even my mother, and did not like to be touched. Hmm and showed affection with punches and things like that. That's well, not good. he also, I know, was deeply affected by the 1918 pandemic, which, of course, since we're currently going through the coronavirus right now, it's interesting to note what an impact um, it, the, the 1918 pandemic had on, on your father. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Well, it's very interesting. The 1918 influenza pa pandemic was not the pa not the epidemic in New York that actually hurt my father. Simultaneous to that influenza epidemic, 
1918, there was also a polio outbreak. Mm. And my father developed polio uh, when he was four years old in 1918. He was born in 1914. And um, his father, uh, my grandfather worked in, there was a huge call for doctors in World War I, a universal call for doctors, especially urologists, because of the venereal disease that was in the trenches and all sorts of other horrible things like gangrene. So my grandfather worked in World War I. He went abroad to offer his services to the people, you know, to the people in the trenches. And um, I don't know how long he was over there. I don't know whether he was over there intermittently. All I know is I have his uniform. I, I have a picture of him in uniform. I have his war blankets, which I bought at, bought at summer camp with me. And um, I know that he did this. So I, I have no idea when he came home, but it's entirely possible he came home in 1918 to find his son paralyzed. I don't know. But all I know is that my father was never told he had polio. Never told. He, um, he knew that his left hand didn't react in time to catch a ball. He couldn't catch a ball. He was somewhat spastic because the left side of his body had been paralyzed for four years. But my father, as a young adult, did not know why his body didn't work right. So he, one leg was about an inch shorter than the other leg, which gave him a swaying, kind of graceful limp for the rest of his life. But he never knew why until he was 35 years old. Because even though he hated his father, his father was a, was a right winger, my father was a communist, his father was a doctor, my father was a science fiction writer, it couldn't have been more different in many ways. Um, I never knew my father hated his father until my father himself was very, very old. I never would have guessed because we were there every single Sunday at grandma and grandpa's house and everything seemed fine. Hmm. But that was purely superficial. Um, my dad grew up in a very gothic household and um, he never knew why he was different or couldn't participate in sports which I think must have caused him to be um, the introvert he became. Well, and that's kind of how he discovered books and became such a serious science fiction reader, right? Um, wasn't it War of the Worlds that he discovered first? Um, I do not know. I don't remember what he discovered first, but all, all I know is he would bring up the most obscure books for me. I wasn't allowed to touch his collection. He had a collection of 20,000 hardcovers, many of them first edition. Yes, and we were in a tiny house in Queens. Every single wall was double deep with books. And um, I had a disagreement with Pat Rothfuss about how you pull a book. My father said, you never grasp a book by its spine. You pull it from behind the book. And, um, you know, I told this to Pat, but he put grasp it by the spine in his book anyway. So I guess uh, librarians differ on this issue. But um, anyway, I wasn't allowed to touch his books, so he would give me a book. He'd go down to the basement, dig around, and come up with this old book with no, no dust jacket and just hand it to me. And that's how I got into science fiction and fantasy. I didn't choose my books. He chose them for me. <laughs> which well, was a very pretty good curator uh, yes. to choose your books. Um, do, you, uh, do you recall? Well, I guess we'll get into your childhood a little bit later, but. Um, so he uh, was an early reader because he wasn't into sports and, and, you know, had the complications with polio. How early and how young was he when he started writing himself? Let's see. Well, I think he published The Man from Ariel in 1938. Does that sound right to you? At which point he would have been 24? Um, let's see. Man from Ariel. I have that in my notes. Um, I believe it was 36. Oh, 36. So he was 22. Mm. But that so, was, you know, that was his, his first published book, published story. Well, there's some interesting um, history on the publication of the Man from Ariel. Can you tell us a little bit about that? His first. I really story? don't know much about it except that I know that um, Hugo Gernsback didn't pay his authors. He was infamous for this. And my father uh, was always a very um, combative person. And 
he also had, um, because his fa the family had been there, here so long, and he had an aristocratic upbringing, he was the son of a doctor, um, he had a sense of self-righteousness that I think a lot of young authors don't have. And when Hugo Gernsback failed to produce the five dollars he was supposed to pay my dad, uh, my father got together with other writers and sued him and won the princely sum of $75, which he you know, passed out to all the other writers who hadn't been paid. But then my father wrote a story under a pseudonym and submitted it to, to Gernsback again and once again was not paid. I think the thing that's most noteworthy about this story, aside from the fact that this young whippersnapper sued the man who put his first, you know, story in the print, which is like something nobody does. But Gernsback, and you have to remember what era this was, Gernsback was paying himself a hundred thousand dollars a year, which was a monstrously huge salary while stiffing all of his authors. <laughs> this is just one of the men we honor greatly in our <laughs> industry. Right. You know, the other already has been called out by Jeanette Nick. But, I mean, Gernsback wasn't exactly a prince either. <laughs> so. no. and, and I think that taught your father a lot about uh, responsibility towards his writers. Although, early on, when he was first publishing his first magazine, I think it was Stirring Science Stories, he yeah. was getting a lot of stories donated to him. Yes. Right? Yes, he was getting, he had no budget. He was not being paid, and he had no money to pay his authors. But he was very open about that. He would basically say, I have no money. If you want to be in print, I will put you in print if I like your story, but I can't pay you. So he was totally honest about it, as opposed to Gurren's fact that he's stupid and paying himself $100,000. So right. it's a little different. Right. And Wilhelm was a part of a group um, that referred to themselves as the Futurians, um, an early science fiction club uh, in New York City. But they were not the first generation. They were the second generation. There was already a generation that was selling to Gernsback before uh, Wilhelm and Paul and, and that group came around. And there's a huge difference between that earlier group and Don's group, which is that the Futurians all worked together. They had a communal attitude towards publishing these early magazines like Stirring Stories of Science Fiction. And they worked together critiquing each other. Was that a philosophy that, uh, you know, how, what, what can you tell us about how that philosophy affected Don throughout his whole career? Well, um, you know, of course, I wasn't born at this point. And uh, what I know, I read from Damon Knight's book, which is really quite amusing. Um, and he captures my mom and dad so perfectly. It's, it's pretty funny. Um, but uh, my father knew he was not a good writer. He knew that. He knew his talents lay, el lay elsewhere. And he always described himself as a fair to middling writer. And, well, he published uh, 18 novels. He, he, he published 18 novels and book of nonfiction and almost 100 short stories, yeah. But, too uh, shabby. Not too shabby, but, I mean, none of them were really great books. I mean, some of them are better than others. None of them are great. The Mar Mike Mars series um, <clears throat> was actually a tribute to his cousin who was killed in World War II. Um, his, his cousin was named Alfred Moss. And Mike Mars, Mike Mars stands for Michael Alfred Simpson, Alfred Ross Simpson. So he, that was his tribute to his cousin. Mm -hmm. But um, it's a very misogynistic group of books. <laughs> and I read one of them, and I said, I am never reading anything of my father's again, ever, ever. I mean, <laughs> you, have to, you have to realize, you know, I, I did not um, read a lot of my father's stuff. I read more of his short stories than than his novels because I mean I was living in his world I was I was run by his his rules he completely overwhelmed the household and the last thing I needed in my life was more of my dad <laughs> so now you might ask me how could I stand to work between my mother and my father for ten years well I think we'll get there we'll get the job up <laughs> uh, eventually um, but but during this 
time, this formative period, um, and I, yes, and most of my information comes from the Futurians. I read Damon Knight's book and highly recommend it to anyone who's serious about studying the foundations of the genre. But it's also very enjoyable. Yeah, yeah, it's a fun read, and and they seem to have a really fun, playful attitude towards um, the community at the time too. What do you know about that from from stories from your father? Well, I know quite a bit about it. I know they only did the dishes once a week. <laughs> I know that Fred and my dad didn't actually sleep there because I think Fred was actually married. My dad slept on my on my grandparents' sofa, and my grandparents had then sold the house. The whole lot was ripped down and they moved to the west side um and my grandfather was the house doctor of the hotel in sonia which must have been a nightmare for him because that was full of awkward divas but <laughs> that's another story um but uh, um i know that i know what they ate which i'm, I'm reluctant to tell you but I also know that um, Hannes Bach and, and the people that lived there, Cornbluth and um, Doc Lowndes and a whole bunch of other people lived, actually lived there. And even though uh, Fred and my dad didn't live there, they hung out there a lot. And um, the other person, my father was the oldest. I think he was 26, 24, 25, 26. And the youngest person that used to hang out there was Isaac Asimov, and he was 16. And my father told me that Isaac would come over almost every day and make such a royal pain of himself <laughs> because he had such a humongous ego, even at 16, when he had not achieved anything, um, that after a few hours, they would all pick him up and physically throw him down the stairs. <laughs> wow. And obviously Isaac survived that. But uh, my father said Isaac had to grow into his ego. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, so, how did was your mother a science fiction fan before she met Don, and how did they meet each other, and what's her story with sci-fi? Um, she was not a science fiction fan. She was friends with Rosalind Moore, who was a science fiction fan and knew the Futurians. And of course, the Futurians were a bunch of you know geeky dudes, although they didn't use that word back then. Geeky dudes who hung out without any women. And Rosalind uh, knew my mother, and she brought her over there one night. And <clears throat> my mother was then smoking, although people who knew her later couldn't even imagine this. My mother was smoking cigarettes, and she had a job because my grandfather was a jeweler and, and ran a you know jewelry factory, and she helped him run the factory. And then she worked for for a law office, so she actually was working during the depression, and um, you know which was really unusual. But um, she went over there, and she offered everybody cigarettes. And my father was the last one in the row. And everybody took a cigarette except my father. And my father said he would never smoke a cigarette because cigarettes ruin the delicate enamel of the teeth, and once that goes, all else follows. Which apparently is a quote from somebody else, and I've forgotten who that other person is. But uh, my father did not make that up. Um, but my, my mother thought my father was so obnoxious that she immediately stopped smoking. <laughs> so it proved them wrong, essentially. So, mm. so during this time, um, your father was corresponding with lots of other science fiction writers um, outside of the New York area. And I know that you told me that you have some of those letters, including some from like H.P. Lovecraft. Can you tell us about well, I only have, I, unfortunately, I only have the ones from Lovecraft. I have hmm. quite a few Lovecraft letters which have been scanned and transcribed so that the person who's compiling his letters has them. But um, my father wrote to Lovecraft in 1935, and he was 21 years old. And so he had an avid correspondence at age 21 with H.P. Lovecraft the year before Lovecraft died. He died in 36. So um, it's pretty interesting. My father was publishing the Fantagraph at that time. And I remember one letter um, talks about how, or uh, Lovecraft tells my dad how he had gone to the house of um, the Howards to find out um, whether Howard actually committed suicide and, and did verify Howard's suicide. So that, that was, and he wrote his, his obituary. 
That was, mm. that was very interesting. I have a long hand from, I have a written obituary for um, Robert Howard, the long hand of Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's, that's some pretty awesomely nerdy stuff. Um, yes. So, <laughs> so he, he um, was corresponding. I think what's really one thing that we need to remind our listeners is that when your father was trading these letters and writing these stories, Gernsback was pretty much the only person publishing science fiction and doing it through the magazines. But there wasn't a, a, there wasn't science fiction publishing as we think of it now. There wasn't. This was like how my generation would think of punk rock in the early the early days of the 80s, you know, like this was people trading zines, um, communicating with each other through letters, and I think it's really important for to set the stage for, you know, just how much of an organizer your father and the Futurians were. Yeah, my father was definitely an organizer. I think he was pretty much, I think in the, in Damon's book, I think he presents him as if he's one of the, the leader, if not one, maybe one of the leaders, but definitely one of the leaders in the group. And, um, you know, my dad was, has, was always very opinionated, very alpha, <laughs> and, um, you know, was, he had a lot of fights with people as a result of this, but, um, that's just who he was. Right. Yeah. So, so he transitioned to, I mean, he published a lot of people believe that the pocketbook of science fiction, which was edited by your father, was the first use of the term science fiction on the cover of a book. Do you know if, if that's the case? That is what I've been told. Heinlein gets a lot of credit for uh, the term speculative fiction, but I think your father putting the term science fiction on the cover of the pocketbook of science fiction probably plays a huge role in, in that term that... Is kind of ubiquitous with the genre now. Was Gernsback using the term? Do you know before before your father? I I think it might have been used within the little, the little community, but I don't think it was used external to the community. Mm. So it wasn't marketing term before then. For, for I don't I don't think so. I don't really know, but I, you know, once again, I wasn't alive then, so I don't, you know, I haven't done a ton of reading. Um, okay. I have other reading to do. <laughs> mostly close for us. My cat is right. threatening to knock over my computer. You can see this too well over there. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we've got a lot of critters going around. So, um, how soon, what was his first, um, what was his first uh, publishing job in the industry? How did how did he get transitioned from being a fan to being a publisher? Well, he started he started in pulps, obviously. But in terms of books, let's let's talk about books. This is I find very interesting. Um, I've looked at all sorts of references online to when my dad started working for Avon Books, which was the first time he ever worked for a book company. It was Avon. Um, and I know the family story about this, which is very specific, but all of the dates say 47, but it couldn't have been 47 because it had to be 44 or 45 because my father was drafted for World War II and my mother and he had only been married a year, but got married in 43. And my mother couldn't eat for four months because she knew that if my father went to war, he'd be killed because he was not soldier material because of the polio. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, she was positive he'd be killed. And um, so she was a wreck. And my father went to Governor's Island, and they lay him on his left side. And for the first time in his life, he heard a heart murmur. And they said, get off government property before you drop dead. And he <laughs> went skipping home in a state of euphoria, <laughs> needless to say. And came home that day, that day, and found a letter in his mailbox from Avon Books saying he'd got offering him his first job in paperback books. Hmm. So that had to be 44 or 45. So all these, all these, all these uh, documents like Wikipedia cites 47. It couldn't have been 47. The war was over by then. So. I don't know how we can get to the bottom of this, but this is what this, this is the story in the family. 
And right. my father always felt it was fate. It was just fate that caused him to, you know, end up getting thrown out of the army and, and, and coming home to do an editorial job. Hmm. At Avon, where he had a huge influence already, because at Avon he introduced the world to like the likes of C.S. Lewis and H.P. Lovecraft, correct? And A. Merritt, no? I know that I found a, I found a story that he had line edited by A. Merritt that I ended up selling. I should have kept it. Yeah. But um, I have kids, and they need you know school bills. I had school bills, but. Um, yeah, he did. He edited the Avon Fantasy Reader for years, and for years at Avon, it was the early days of paperback books. And for some of those years, he was at Avon. He was the only paperback editor. So, and those wow. are the days of the golden age of comic books too. So and in our basement, really in our basement, we had every single golden age comic book, and the outer, you know, the outer cover was beautiful and the inside was just dust. <laughs> <laughs> so he did way more than just science fiction when, when he got there, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and he also did way more at Ace, too. Right. Oh, well, yeah. we're getting to Ace. Uh, yeah. So he was at Avon for a while, but um, that experience led him to want to separate and do something that was more focused on the type of work he wanted to put out. And that's how he got involved with A.A. Wynn, right? Well, A.A. Um, Wynn owned the Ace Magazine Company. And since um, paperback books were, were a new thing, new and up-and-coming thing, he wanted to get a piece of the action. And so he offered my father a job as the founder, basically, of Ace Books, the editor-in-chief and founding editor of Ace Books. And so my father went to Ace to found Ace Books in 1952 on behalf of A.A. Wynn. My father did not own Ace. He was an employee. And this is really important to his career because um, at Ace, he was responsible for 22 books a month personally. Of course, his books were like less than 200 pages long, but still it's you know, a monumental amount of work. And the only thing he wouldn't edit was romance or nurse novels. Or, you know, <laughs> so um, there was a woman editor there. He had other, he eventually had other under editors. But um, he was always the head of the list uh, until A.A. A. Wynn died. And um, he, my father brought back the double novel had been an earlier, it had an earlier manifestation in hardcover. I think in the 1800s, I have to look mm. that up, but I know that my father was not the person to invent the double novel. He just brought it into the modern age. So he made, he invented the ace doubles, which would have an established writer on one side and the other side, a new writer. And that's how he brought out Robert Silverberg, you know, Chip Delaney, you know, uh, Ursula Le Guin, numerous very famous now authors. Um, but uh, he also published Junkie by, Will, by William Gibbs, William um, Burroughs. Um, his, the first edition is spelled with a Y, not an IE, and it's William Lee. He has a pseudonym. Has a pseudonym. Hmm. And um, from what I have heard, this is all hearsay, my father convinced um, Burroughs he originally wanted to call the book Junk, not Junkie. And my father said Junk could be mistaken for a book about trash. <laughs> Whereas a junkie is always a junkie. Right. And Burroughs heard him and called the book Junkie. Wow. <laughs> but um, this is, as I say, I, you know, this is what I've heard. Burroughs did yeah. not tell me himself. So, so uh, uh, Ace was a, a really important uh, you know, publisher for many reasons, but I think in the 50s, he oversaw a huge expansion of the genre just through Ace alone, but they, I'm sure they had competitors at the time, right? They weren't the only well, game in town. There were basically, in terms of science fiction, there were two games, Ace and Valentine. And that was pretty much it. They were smaller, uh, more, more, um, Fancy presses like Shasta, you know, but um, 
basically, those were the two mass market houses. By mass market, I mean small size paperback. And unfortunately for my father, he did not own Ace, whereas Betty and Ian Valentine owned Valentine. So um, Betty had a definite advantage over my father because my father had to please his boss, who was very frugal in the ways of the magazine industry, and um, really a stingy bastard. And people don't realize that, you know, my father was underpaid just the way all of his authors were underpaid because all that underpayment came from, came from A.A. Wynn. And my father got blamed for a lot of it, but um, what happened during the course of his career in the 50s and 60s was uh, um, that he would find an author, let's say Robert Silverberg, and Silverberg, my father said, was the greatest hack that ever lived. And I said this to Bob, and Bob was incredibly flattered. My, my father said, no, and he should be flattered, my father said, a good hack, and Robert was, was the best. <laughs> could write a good book every six weeks. Yikes. Not a great Yikes. book. Not a great book. A good book. A, worth, a, good, a book worth reading every six weeks. And I said that to Bob, and he said, oh, and that was my happiest time. But, I mean, <laughs> I talked to Bob about Betty, because Bob and I are friends. I mean, after a while, you, you look across a room at a convention, and you make eye, eye contact with somebody and you realize the two of you are the only ones who have been around for 50 years. And that's the way Bob and I made contact. And now Bob and I are like family. Because I mean, I, when I first met Bob, I was probably six and he was probably 20. So, you know, it's, it's, um, but it, it was a long, long time ago. And we've all both been around since then. But, um, right. You know, what, it, what used to happen is my father would find somebody, and it, within a short period of time, that person would leave him for Valentine. Because Betty would say, ah, I see this person selling. Walheim's only paying him $1,500. let us pay him $2,500. They would just kick off my father's authors. And my father was, you know, really deeply distressed by this because he couldn't pay more than he was allowed to pay. So he lost everything to Betty, and um, she got great credit, and he got um, basically lost all the people he found. He, de he developed for her. So he was he was very very bitter about Valentine books. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know we see the other end because we're when we're researching all of of uh, Bill's books, uh, we're seeing mostly him talking about the process of selling to Ace you know, on his end, but he also sold to Valentine, too, so yeah. with uh, Martin Timeslip, for example. And uh, we'll get to Phil in a little bit. I want to just stick with Ace for a little bit. Um, at, at the time, when he was um, running, doing the doubles, was that, um, how did he, did he ever talk about, like, why he would choose to pick one certain author to uh, publish by themselves? Um, and to do like a solo book. What was his thinking on well, that? Well, I, I think, I mean, I, I don't know that he ever actually actually spoke to me about this, but I think the, the thought was to to introduce a new writer on the back of an established writer. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, he, yeah. And when he published Junkie, he published an anti-drug uh, pamphlet on the back of it. Really? So that, was, that was also a double, yeah. <laughs> and um, so Junkie's first edition is an ace double, but okay. um, he he used an established writer to basically uh, launch a young writer. All right. And so, the, were... the the long the longer books probably were the ones that were by themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, with um, so w w what point in your childhood um, did you were were you Born during the Ace era, did you were you around for any of that? Um, yeah, I was born in no. December fifty one, December nineteen fifty one. So my father started in Ace in fifty two, so I was an infant. Oh. Yeah, yeah my you were pretty young. Ace. So I grew up during the Ace era. Right. There were a lot and of uh, storm clouds over the dinner table during during the later <laughs> part of that era. <laughs> right. 
But he took you to your first science fiction convention at six years old, correct? Yeah, for some reason he thought six was okay, five was too young. I, Makes sense. But it was at the sky top room of the Hotel New York, or right across from Penn Station in New York, and it was, I think, three rooms. It was three rooms. And the thing I noticed the most at age six was that everybody was wearing the same black men's shoes, and that somebody had a giant African millipede on his arm. Yikes. <laughs> you know, what, right. what, what did the six-year-old notice? That's what the sort of things the six-year-old notices. Right. But, uh, yeah. You were going to these conventions as a young kid, and, you know, the family business was science fiction, so you ended up developing friendships with a lot of these writers or and or, like, kind of getting dragged into your father's business. Tell us about tell us about that. Well, I I don't remember the beginning of it. I mean, I was born into the business, literally. I, you know, I grew up in a book in a house filled with books. My father, we could never watch TV. My father was always writing. He, he had a, he was an incredible correspondent. He was either he was typing all night long. He typed eighty words a minute with two fingers, like two fingers. Wow. And he pounded that typewriter. It was a uh, Remington typewriter. He pounded that manual typewriter so much that when he finally retired it and got to, got a Smith Corona electric, it was in the basement. And when I would go into the basement, whenever the, the floor would shake in any way, the typewriter would space. We're talking about a <laughs> manual typewriter. It would space by itself. Yeah, it was, yeah. He traumatized his typewriter. <laughs> but so what kind of book? Uh, it took him forever to find an electric typewriter that would work for him because he pounded so hard. Mm. And Smith Corona was the only one that would ever work for him. He, so what kind of books he was he reading? reading computer. What? <laughs> what kind of books was he reading to you as a kid? Oh, God, all sorts of interesting things. Well, he read all of the L. Frank Baum Oz books. But he was a Baum purist. He told me, never read any, any Oz book that isn't written by Bell. Hmm. And he, he felt that Ruth Plumley Thompson was just too cutesy and too sweet. And Bell had kind of a creepy edge. Yeah. And um, that was really cool about Bell. And I remember that. When he, when I was really little, when I was you know three, four, five, he would read me. He read me all the Oz books and all the surrounding kingdom books. He also read me a lot of the colored fairy tale books, which I don't recall as well. He also um, he read to me. He read poetry to me a lot as a child, even poems I didn't really understand because of the rhythm. Mm. He was te- trying to teach me the rhythm of language, and he had an amazing voice. He actually was an incredible singer. And an amazing deep bass voice and a beautiful reading voice. Do you remember and which? Do you remember which poets? Poet? Pardon? Do you remember which poets? Vachel Lindsay was one of his favorites. Okay. And I know that Vachel Lindsay is probably now, um, you know, verboten because of the Congo. Mm-hmm. Um, but he read me the Congo when I was too young to realize any racist aspect of it. And he did not, he was not a racist. He was always, you know, my mother was a civil rights worker. And um, my father was a communist atheist who believed in all people being equal. And um, so he was never racist, but he read it to me for the sound of the actual words. Just the, the for cadence. The rhythm, yeah. For the rhythm, yeah. for the sound, for the cadences. Yeah. And um, that, was, that was really brilliant. And uh, Vachel Lindsay... I wish somebody would publish the acceptable poems of Bachel Lindsay in a separate volume because um, a lot of his stuff is really amazing. Mm. Yeah, so uh, um, he, so it's clear that he was talking to you about the mechanics of story and, and talking to you about the family business. But kind of not. Out. Yes and no. Because he read me these things that I now realize in retrospect, I, I love because of the way they sounded. So he was teaching me to sound, but he never made a point of telling me that. Mm-hmm. I only realized this in retrospect. And he never really talked about the business. He just complained about the business over the dining <laughs> dinner table. 
or you come home in a horrible mood, or you come home in a great mood, or you come home and we had a writer over for dinner. You know, so it was, he was very moody. He, um, he was actually a very sensitive person for his own feelings, extremely insensitive for the, to the feelings of others. Right. So he had, he had very close personal relationships with some of his writers. And Many of his of, writers. Yeah. Yeah, and um, specifically, um, I know some of the ones are like C.J. Cherry, Cherry, I believe, and um, Marion Zimmer Bradley. I know you talked uh, you talked about in yeah, your essay. And Bob you Silverberg, you know, and um, I know that he and Bob are very close because Bob lived in New York, so um, they were very close. Um, but. He had a lot of very close relationships. I remember Andre Norton called him at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I was flabbergasted as a kid to hear the phone ring at 2 o'clock in the morning. And my father talked to her. And nobody called my father at 2 in the morning. It was, it was, I still don't know right. if that was a bad you know. Well, since we're in the Ace era, we got to start talking about the man himself, Bill K. Dick, who started publishing um, with your father during the Dosey Do era. He um, had books in the Ace Doubles, so he was the new writer yeah. often, um, in, in those situations. And it's funny because when every time we, we review one of these books, we talk about the Dosey Do, and a lot of those Dosey Do's were books that at the time were the more established author, but of course are ones that are, are kind of forgotten. forgotten. Yeah. 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 Because Bill has has passed him, but lots of Bill, space pirates. Yeah, lots of space yeah. pirates. Um, but Bill specifically credited Don several times as having saved his life, literally. By Did giving he specify why? Well, he there's one of the letters that he had done about one of the letters we read. It was, I think it was Game Players of Titan, and he had had to make m many changes to the book based on Father's editorial input. And he basically re 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 said, you know what, Don, um, you basically saved my life, so I'm going to do whatever you need me to do. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think Dick could admit that a lot of Don's input for his books generally made them better, more marketable books. Well, I think that was what my father was intending to do, because he, he needed his books to sell, otherwise he was doing mm -hmm. his job. Mm -hmm. I think that one of you uh, wrote me um, and asked about, specifically about something about Christianity, and my father didn't want him insulting Christianity in the book. My father had no problem personally with anyone insulting any religion. <laughs> any, religion. any religion, seriously. Um, yeah, that was the but my yeah. father would, did not want to lose his job. Mm. And I think a lot of people don't realize that some of the decisions my father made editorially or otherwise was so that he wouldn't lose his job. Right. And, you know, when he came to Dawn, he owned a company, so things were very different. And I remember that one, um, during, the first, during the first decade of Daw, my father wanted to publish Thomas Burnett Swan, who was a very openly gay writer in his writing, not just himself, but in his writing. And, it, you know, it was the 70s, the early 70s, and um, New American Library wanted to pull the book. And my father absolutely went head to head with them and refused to allow them to pull the book because of the homosexual content. And so once he owned his own company, he was really able to do what he wanted to do. At Ace, it's debatable. You know, he couldn't pay those authors as much as Betty Valentine was because he didn't have the budget because his boss wouldn't give him the money. So, you know, he was kind of stymied at Ace in a funny kind of way. Well, that, that, that is a really important thing for us because we did talk a lot. The book was Eye in the Sky was the one that um, had a very was very critical of Christianity and uh, your father had asked Bill to change it to basically the Baha'i faith in yeah. the book. And it didn't make a ton of sense in, in the book, but you can read it as like, you can translate it in your own head, kind of like how people translate 
Klingons in Star Trek to looking like they do now when they watch old Star Trek. Yeah. And um, it is really important to hear that your father would be doing this as a commercial decision and not one as an ideological decision, I think, because we definitely wondered about that when we, we covered Iron Sky. Yeah, no, it was definitely, he just didn't want to lose his job. He was scared to lose his job. When was a scary boss? Uh, yeah, he yeah, exactly. Cheap. I mean, he was super cheap. Everybody thinks that you know Ace Ace was cheap, but my dad was cheap. The fact is that my family drove a 1938 Dodge until 1960. Hmm. So you know, my my car it was beautiful. It was bright green and it had running boards and it had a rat rattan back seat that was as big as a sofa. You know, but my parents drove a 1938 Dodge. And when yeah. we had the station, we drove somewhere and camped. We had no money. We had no money either. Because, you know, Wynn didn't pay my father. He made right. him vice president of ACE literally on his deathbed. Literally on his deathbed. Wow. Well, and it was a huge, bold move to publish Dick at all because in the early days, you know, he was, he was the political author. He did even, you know, his first two books with ACE. Solar Lottery and The World Jones Made were both political. And, you know, he certainly was breaking new ground. So um, I think it meant a lot to Dick that your father saw in him, you know, something something special. You know, yeah. I think that meant a lot to Phil because we know that eventually he did, in his dedication for Now Wait for Last Year, he said Don Wilhelm had done more for science fiction than anyone else. I wow, know. I didn't know that. I didn't know he said yeah. that. Yeah, it's in the dedication. Xerox. Xerox. Scan it and send me Xerox to the page. I want to see it. But I only, <laughs> met, you know, I only met Phil Dick once. Only once. And that was, you know, toward the end of his life. He was living in L.A. in an apartment. And my husband and I went to visit him. And I, he barely had the door open before he grabbed my arm, dragged me across the floor, and pulled out a tattered pulp magazine. And on the cover of this pulp magazine that I no longer remember the title to, it 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 said, you know, the title of a story by Philip K. Dick, and then the entire magazine was edited by my dad. And I'm still trying to find out what magazine that was, because my two experts, uh, Marty Greenberg and Bob Wein, Wein, you know, Weinberg are both dead. And those are the people I used to call and say, hey, Bob, what, what magazine was that in? And he knew every magazine, so I don't know what magazine it was, but he said, your father put me in print. He put me in print. It was very important to Phil. It was so yeah. sweet. Yeah. And so that must have been a really cool experience, too. I mean, you met all, you've met so many authors because you grew up in this industry. I'm sure some of the excitement of meeting, <laughs> meeting these authors is, is just kind of like your normal life. But for, but Phil was an author who was not going to conventions a lot then, so it must have been a really cool experience to meet him in his own environment, too. Well, my father told me, he said, when you meet Phil, he's very self-effacing. Don't let him get away with that. I said, okay, but, you know, obviously I couldn't, you know, I couldn't be rude. I mean, um, but he was a very self-effacing man. Have you guys ever read Confessions of a Crap Artist? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I have not. That is as close to an autobiography of Phil Dick as oh, you've really? ever been. Really? Yeah. Wow. It's very, very, very close to true. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And it's a terrific read, too. <laughs> so your father did talk to you about, about Phil K. Dick and his feelings for him as, as, as a writer, then, I take it. Yes. No, he said he was brilliant, but the least commercial writer he had ever encountered. And this was true. No, it was true. The books did yeah. not sell. Even, I mean, and you know, Russ Galen was his agent for years and re represented his estate after he died on behalf of, of Tessa Dick. Um, and so he sold all the short stories to the movies. He sold Blade Runner, etc., and, you know, Phil Dick died before Blade Runner was completed, so he never really got to see his success. But 
what, what Russ told me, at least in the early decades after Blade Runner, was that Blade Runner really had not increased Phil's sales all that much. Hmm. Only about 10%. That's it. Because his book still remained kind of uncommercial, except perhaps for Androids, which, of course, was in the hands of Valentine, then run by Judy Lynn Del Rey, mm -hmm. another great genius in our industry. But, um, you know, she didn't want the rest of, the, of, of Phil's books. She just wanted that one. Because <laughs> they kind of really tell. Um, but that was partly her thing, so. Right. In, in your, you sent us a copy of an essay that you wrote about your father. You talked about how he supported uh, Marion Zimmer Bradley when she was working for him, but writing a book for one of your father's competitors. And I think that really moved me in the sense that he was, you know, willing to support this writer who was taking a book straight to another house. That That's pretty yeah. interesting. Let, let's, take a, let's take a step back and talk about Marion a little bit, and also my father. My father was... Um, a stickler for loyalty. Every single person that left him for Valentine was his enemy. I mean, at least temporarily. Um, and, you know, he felt, he felt personally wounded by everybody who left him. And he didn't understand that people needed to pay their rent. And, you know, um, he was being shortchanged at the same time, which they didn't understand, but that's a whole other story. But, um, you know, my father was a stickler for loyalty and very, very, very tough on people who left him. So the fact that Marion um, came running to my father from Lesser Del Rey's office all the time crying uh, was a very unusual occurrence. This, this, this was not a typical thing. The thing about Marion is that she had such a horrible, abusive childhood in Texas. I think her father beat her. Um, and then her first husband, um, a for, a Bradley, uh, forced her to get many illegal abortions, and all she ever wanted was a lot of children. And she fought him and finally had David and left him and um, went on. But her waking life was so awful that she completely escaped into fiction to the point where if she finished a chapter, the last chapter of the book, she could not sleep until she had written the first chapter of the next book. Wow. Because her entire world was fiction. Reality didn't really exist to her. And, um, my God, Oops. who is calling? What's happening? That is not me. It's not, I don't think it's me. Could be me. I don't think so. I don't see anything. David? It's not me. It's not me. That's not me. All right. Let's like, okay, go. I stopped. Right. Um, we can edit that out. So, <laughs> Marion wrote too much to be published by any one publisher. So she was a hack her whole life. The only book that wasn't a hack, wasn't a hack, you know, one, for a hack in terms of write it fast, get it out, write it fast, get it out. Um, almost no rewriting. Uh, Marion was a sloppy writer and she just wanted her books to go in first draft, last draft, that was it. And Lester knew this book could be huge. So um, she always had multiple publishers. And um, when she was writing this to the Avalon, she was so proud of it. But it also drove her crazy because Lester kept saying, make it deeper, make it deeper. And she would come flying down the hall to my father's office and throw herself over on top of the desk. And my father, of course, would pull himself back as fast as possible because he didn't touch people. And um, he would just weep. You know, he wants me to make it deeper. How many times can I make it deeper? But the fact is, he was right. He was right. He tortured that book out of her, but she was so proud of it. Nice. She knew it was the right thing to do. But then he rejected her next book. <laughs> so, you know, it was just a normal Bradley book. But, um, so that situation was really unusual. I mean, 
Uh, C.J. Cherry um, and my father were so close. I think my father was probably closer to Carolyn than any other author. Um, Carolyn was a school teacher from Oklahoma. She taught classics. She spoke fluent Greek, French, and Latin, and still does. And um, she has a master's from Johns Hopkins. Um, and, you know, she could have been a teacher. She was very happy being a teacher, but um, she kept sending manuscripts to my father, and finally my father bought two at once, uh, Gated of Rail and Brothers of Earth. And my father, the only reason Carolyn knew that these books had been bought, he never, like, wrote her a letter saying, I love these books, these are wonderful, Can I, will you accept X money? He just sent her two contracts, and wrote a cover letter saying, I think we're going to publish your Vrel first. You know, so, uh, so she, she, I think she sat back and said, um, I think I just sold two books. <laughs> you know, but, um, but she came to New York, uh, having never been to New York, although having been all over the world, many places all over the world, um, and she was very shy, so shy that I would venture to call it on the verge of pathologically shy. Mm. But my dad was also shy, even though he was a fighter, he was also pretty shy in his own way. And um, the two of them just bonded. And they redid my whole bedroom. It was Carolyn's room. And nobody could have been happier than me. Because honestly, Carolyn was the child my parents always wanted. I, mm. I never <laughs> felt like I was really what they wanted. I was too re I was too rebellious. I fought with them too much. You know, I guess it was too much like my father. But, um, you know, Carolyn uh, was incredibly erudite, incredibly smart, and she and my father would just talk for hours and hours and hours, and she would have break breakfast at the kitchen table, go into the office with them, read manuscripts all afternoon, then, you know, go home with them, have dinner, and she'd have three meals a day with them and never see anything, never see a museum, never go shopping <laughs> or anything in New York. And my father finally said to me one November day, cold November day, he said, hey, Carolyn, outside. I said, don't make me do this. But she, you know, she, had, she had never said a word to me. And um, I said, Carolyn, Betsy's taking you out. So, okay, I walked through, I walked outside with Carolyn, and um, I said to her, would you like to go to a museum? And she shrugged. I said, okay. Uh, would you like to go shopping? Shrugged. Um, and in desperation, I just said, let's walk through Central Park. And we walked through Central Park for several hours, and, you know, it was a lovely day. It was a little on the cold side, which I now know is good for her, because she hates heat. She loves cold. Um, but back then, I didn't know, and she was wearing an unlined leather jacket, leather coat. And um, we got back to the house, and I didn't find out for three years what she was thinking. And at a, a convention in Kansas City, she had a bunch of fans in her room one night, and she told the story of how I brought her to Central Park. And she was bringing me to Central Park and I didn't have my gun? <laughs> and then she looked around and saw, wait a minute, this is a family place. This is a nice place. Why do people say such nasty things about it on TV? This isn't a dangerous place. And she had totally had her mind opened by seeing people, you know, on skateboards and people reading books and eating their lunch and feeding the pigeons and playing frisbee and whatever else in Central Park. And, you know, it wasn't until that moment that I realized that the news media all over this country denigrates New York. So she was... And, she, saying, was and she, she, she was taught that, um, she was basically told that it was a dangerous place to go <laughs> and you just don't go there. Hey, uh, sorry guys, my battery's dying. Hold on, let me just plug in. <laughs> All right. Anyway, but um, well, I love Central me. Park. Okay. So, but um, I love Central Park. But she never realized it was anything but deadly, because that's how the news media represented it nationwide. Right. 
So, except in New York, obviously, where we know better. But it's um, pretty outrageous if you think about it. Um, yeah, so let's, um, you spend a lot of time going to conventions and, you know, um, you told me the other day when we talked that you often had a situation where some of the writers were terrified of your father. And so they ended up taking it out on you. Was that just you or your mother or both? No, it was just Did me. Did you get the most of it? I got the most of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, um, Harlan abused me like he abused many other people in public um, in an attempt to uh, insult my parents via me. Um, but I, I wouldn't call that in any way unusual because that was his modus operandi. But, um, I mean, there were a lot of other artists and authors who felt that they had been badly treated by my father, and they would yell at me about it. And often, like in one case, um, somebody yelled at me about something I didn't even know about. I mean, how was I supposed to respond? I was a 14-year-old kid when this happened. <laughs> you know, it, it, it was just, it was, I was never, I was never just a fan. I was always the daughter of a pro. Even if I hung out with the Boston crowd or with, the, you know, the Philly crowd, I was always, you know, I was always Don's daughter. I was never just a fan. So um, when I became a teenager, people started to attack me, which was right. kind of terrible. Yeah, it, it, it didn't make me feel good about them in terms of their character. Let's just say that. Right. So then. Um, your father eventually decided to leave Ace, um, mostly because the bills were racking up, and I know his boss had passed away, and there were some issues over who was controlling the company at that point. Yeah. Um, right. And so, yeah. for basically, he had no choice, but he had to kind of start his own thing. Can you tell us about the founding of DAW and, and, and how that happened? and? And, and uh, I know your your mother became more involved at that point, too. Yeah. Uh, well, my mother had worked in a legal firm, so she was really very qualified. And um, she was very smart and bored to tears being a housewife for 20 years. But um, my father, my, when A.A. A. Wynn died and made him vice president, made my father vice president, his A.A. A. Wynn's son-in-law took over. That was the first person that took over. And he wanted Ace. Ace was a fabulously strong genre house. But they specialized in genre. They were not a literary house. Hmm. And uh, A.A. Wynn's son-in-law wanted them to become a literary house. So, of course, he basically tanked the company. And it was bought by Charter Communications. And they had no money. And, you know, their attitude was when, when an artist wanted to get, wanted to get paid, they would tell my father, who wants to get paid, find another artist. You know, and my father opened his drawer one day and found seven signed contracts for novels that he couldn't didn't have the money to pay on, to pick on. And he realized his, his reputation would be ruined. And he told my mother he was gonna leave and I talked about it, and he just walked out one day. Sheila, my business partner, Sheila Gilbert, was there when he walked out. He just walked into her room and said, Hi, I'm leaving, bye. And he walked out. Nobody there knew that he was leaving. And um, it was the first time he was unemployed since the since before World War II. And I was in college. And even though college back then cost four grand a year, a private college, you know, it was still a lot of money back then. And uh, my father uh, was not in a great situation um, knowing that he was unemployed with a child in college. Um, and his wife also had no work, so um, that was the situation. And he uh, he tended toward panic attacks, and he basically had a lot of, you know, low blood sugar panic attacks. Um, he went to various people to try to strike up some sort of arrangement or other, and 
nobody really was interested because he didn't have money. He didn't have any money. He had no money because he worked for A.A. Wynn for 20 years. So he was broke. He had no money in the bank. And um, Herb Schnall, who was the CEO of New American Library at the time, knew of my father's reputation and what he had done for Wynn. And he told, him, I told my father, oh, yeah, come to us. We'll take you on any way you want. Distribution client. You can be part of our, our imprint. We'll buy you. We, we, we can, you know, do it, do it, anything you want. So my father and mother, I was home at that point. My father, my, my mother, and I talked about how we we're going to found it all. And my mother, my father decided that he just didn't want to uh, work to pad someone else's pocketbook anymore. He just didn't. He wanted to work for himself. He didn't want to work to make somebody else rich. Um, he had spent 20 years making A.A. Wynn and Betty Valentine rich, and he was sick of it. Mm -hmm. So um, he basically founded a company, DAW, that's not a distribution client, and it's not an imprint. Mm -hmm. DAW is like the camel of publishing. It, um, we are, you know, we are in, co we have a co-publishing arrangement with New American Library that then became Penguin, that then became Penguin Putnam, that then became you know, Penguin Random House. So our mother company has gotten larger and larger, but the deal has evolved, but basically remained essentially the same. That we share expenses, we share profits, and we exist as a private company under the umbrella of this huge um, mega corp. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. How, yeah. how did you get involved with DAW? Uh, uh, was that right way after you graduated? Or? Um, well, I graduated and lived in Cambridge for two years and worked for uh, printers, which was really interesting. Although it, tur it turned out kind of irrelevant because printers uh, then uh, went to, were just in the phase of going from hot type to cold type. So I worked on the very first printer, printing computers, which were the size of rooms. And every time you corrected a mistake, um, it would do things like italicize the entire next chapter. So, you know, at 4 o'clock in the morning, we were trying to get the books out. We would actually wax in, you know, the, 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 change, the changes rather than do it the way we were supposed to do it through the computer. But um, that was a very interesting experience for me. But um, I think I was mostly avoiding my parents by staying in Cambridge. And so I eventually went home to New York, and I got a job in photography. And I worked for a man for two days until he ripped my blouse off in the dark room. And I ran out of there. And um, I went home to, and told my parents. And my father called this guy up and put the fear of hell, fear, fear of damnation into this guy, I'm sure. And he promptly sent me um, a hundred dollar check. And my father said, look, well, until you get another job in photography, why don't you come and work for me? And that was in October of 75. Wow. And you've been with DAW ever since, and now uh, it's, it's your company. Um, you must really love the fact that you're able to continue the tradition that your father had started. Um, how often, I'm sure you and, and Sheila, your business partner, think about, what would Don do every day when, you, when you're making decisions? I, I, no, we don't, because frankly, I don't think that what Don would do in this day and age would be pertinent. <laughs> so, you know, we think of some things about my dad, but, um, you know, my dad was in many ways unkind, and that taught me to be kind by observing his unkindness. And I think that, um, I'm a very different person from my dad, and Sheila, of course, you know, not even her dad, so she's very different also. And she and I are very different, which makes for a good combination for the company. But, um, you know, I stayed there because I realized that working on manuscripts and then standing over on my father's shoulder when he was art directing and telling him everything I thought he was doing wrong was something I was uniquely talented for because I had, I had been an English major in, in college, but I also had attended the Worcester Art Museum School 
in photography. So I was trained in visual arts as well as writing. So I'm kind of, it was kind of a perfect job for me. And I realized that pretty quickly. Because I spent 10 really grueling years in the office between my mother and my father. And it's a miracle I ever survived that time. <laughs> right. But uh, you were learning at the feet of masters, so that's that's also, I'm sure... A very cruel, a, a very cruel taskmaster, let's just say that. <laughs> right. Um, so, from a dickhead's perspective, um, when Jaw published uh, some of the later works of Phil K. Dick, especially Full of My Tears, the policeman said, and um, Scanner Darkly, um, um, Phil had noted that um, his relationship with your father had gotten a little better because he was given more freedom. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, he, in that sense, he, Daw was able to publish two of Phil's masterpieces. Um, but the connection between your father and Philip K. Dick is a really, really important one. And I think I want to, you know, kind of bring it back to, like, what do you think, I believe your father's legacy is incredibly important to the whole genre, but specifically to Philip K. Dick, who said that he was the most important person for the science fiction genre. I think there's only one person that's had a bigger impact on Philip K. Dick's publishing career, and that or comparable, and that's Tony Boucher. When you see the success that after his death that Philip K. Dick has had, is this something that, you, do you think of your father in that context? Like when you see movies like Minority Report and, uh, you know, Total Recall and all these things, having this incredible success, is, I mean, I'm sure that brings to mind the work that your father put in with Phil the, Phil the writer, right? I'm sure, right? Well, I think my father was, um, uh, I'm not sure what the, whether the word is mystified or kind of curious that his work didn't sell better after Blade Runner. And he, I don't think he lived to see, he died in 1990, so I don't know how many of those films he lived to see, um, but it's interesting because even though Phil was an incredibly self-effacing man, uh, genuinely self-effacing man, there are a lot of people who are seemingly self-effacing but they're really egotistical, he wasn't like that. He was genuinely self-effacing. And, um, you know, he was a genuinely modest person and um, not an especially happy one, I think. But uh, my father was really shocked to see that of all the people in science fiction to, to, to go to the screen that early, the most unlikely possible writer. Really. Yeah. And that's why I think he saw it. Because he's published well because he, he enjoyed it the same way he enjoyed the Einstein intersection, you know, by Delaney. So it's, you know, my father found it, it very interesting that in a film format, Phil was really, really commercial, so he wasn't in a book format. Mm. Well, yeah, that's, it is interesting how that happened. Uh, did, were there other writers that um, your father championed that never saw the commercial success that maybe um, our listeners should be on the lookout for? Uh, people that he published that didn't have um, you know, yeah. the kind of mainstream success of an Asimov or a Clark. You know, so many, so many. I mean, um, uh, Sheila and I privately call uh, great, great books that don't sell Kate Wilhelm syndrome. Hmm. Kate Wilhelm was a brilliant, beautiful writer. Her books didn't sell. Why? Who the heck knows? I mean, it, it, it's, it's mystifying even to this day. And that yeah. happens so often. And we're still waiting for Tale Chaser Song by Tad Williams, published in 1985, to be a full-length animated feature. It's a cat 
fantasy. It's a shoe in especially with, with the internet, so full of cats now. It's a no-brainer. Why didn't Disney pick it up? It's just stupefyingly idiotic. And I think um, in some ways a lot of publishers are I feel that way about Hollywood, that they're just stupidly idiotic. They are. They miss the most obvious things. They are. <laughs> you know. So, uh, to my other gig pets here, uh, I, I've done a lot of the talking. You guys have any questions for, for Betsy? You want to want to get in there? Give me a minute, Larry. <laughs> no, I'm good. I Betsy and I had a great conversation before uh, we began. So. Yeah, we kind of chatted before you got here, David. <laughs> <laughs> well, Betsy and I talked the other night. It was great. Uh, yeah, Betsy, it's, it's amazing to talk to you because of uh, the wealth of knowledge you have, specifically on your father, is just, of course, amazing, but the genre as a whole. Um, so, well, um, but last chance, guys, because this is for the podcast, <laughs> not just the, the conversation that you had. But uh, I guess... Um, Let's close with talking about where Daw's going now. Like, uh, I, I, uh, you guys are still, um, working hard, uh, publishing lots of great stuff. I know when I talked to you the other night, you said you were up till, uh, eight in the morning working on an edit in the middle of, uh, yeah. in the middle of a global pandemic. What are you working on now? What, what can we look Well, I now? have, I have, at any given time, I have close to 10,000 page backup. Yeah. So I I have permanent grad student syndrome in the sense that whatever I, I'm doing now, I really should be working. Always. Always. And it's so exhausting. Yeah, yeah. I know and, that. Um, yeah, I'm trying to get through a first draft now that has problems, and so that takes a long time and it's frustrating. And then I have like three books in a row that I'm really looking forward to. I have Celia Friedman, Brock C.S. Friedman, I have Kristen Britton, and I have um, Nettie Okorafor. So, I mean, I have three books in a row that I'm really looking forward to. And then I have books beyond that that are from, the I have one book, which is uh, very long and very brilliant, but almost was the first draft was near uncomprehensible. And so uh, the new author was really great. He rewrote the whole thing, so I had to tackle that. I mean, I have a lot of stuff on my plate. And um, it's actually easier for me to get work done during the pandemic than it is. You know, when, <laughs> I um, hear that. So, I did like, have a, an hour-long meeting today <laughs> online. Right. I have uh, uh, 30,000 words of the uh, work in progress it's just from the uh, from the virus, the corona uh, occasion that we're going through. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, speak for yourself, David. I still have to work. So, yeah, I mean, we're we're all, we're all. I think everyone in, in publishing is worried about the printers being able to keep up because everybody's on short staff, and you know we're worried about the distribution. Yeah, we're all worried. It's frightening, yeah. but at least we can work remotely, whereas a lot of industries can't. Yeah. Right. So, uh, final thoughts on your father. Uh, you know, we. We wanted to do this episode because it is really important for us that, you know, we, we bring, you know, when we started this podcast, I'll, I'll admit, I didn't know who Don Wolheim was. Uh, and I, since we've been doing this podcast, I've taken the role of scholar a little bit more seriously. And that's why I've been reading the Futurians and Search and Wonder and all those things. But when, when we started this, I didn't know who he was, but I kept seeing his name coming up, and I kept seeing, like, his influence, and it was amazing to me. The role of editors gets so overlooked by people uh, who don't understand what his role was. Um, what do you think is the most important impact that Don Wolheim had on, on the genre as a whole? Um... I think his most important impact was his incredible belief in science fiction. Less so in fantasy, but in science fiction. 
Well, there he he did um, make a huge impact in fantasy too. Though. Yeah, no, he, but he was more he he science fiction was his great love. He was never that wild about most fantasy. Right. But um, that was the that was the point of view in the field for many years. That fantasy was like poo poo, and you know, science fiction was intellectual. You know, you know, you know, guys know. Come on. Oh yeah, yeah. Now we draw that hard line between like hard sci-fi and you know pulp sci-fi, right? right. Anthro sci-fi, whatever. But um, yeah, I think the most important thing about my dad, I mean, overall, if I could encapsulate it, is that he was self-directed maverick who genuinely, genuinely didn't give a flying fuck what anybody else thought. And that's why he was able to achieve so much. He was not other directed. It would have been, he would he would have been a nicer person if he had been a little other directed, but he would have he achieved less. And I think that's the most important person, thing about him. That and one other thing, and that is my father had the ability to um, he had a logical. My father had had been a physics major at NYU, and he mm -hmm. dropped out. To join the Futurians, but um, so my father had been involved in mathematics and physics, and he could make that jump of logic from B to L, which a lot of people can't do. Yeah. In other words, you have to go B, you know, B, C, D, E, F. My father could jump, make that jump in logic, and see something that was going to happen in the future that a lot of people couldn't see. And I think that was a really important factor in his personality also. But he was a genuine maverick in every negative and positive meaning of that word. Yeah. Right. Awesome. I think that's a great place to end on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Betsy, Betsy, I really yeah. appreciate your time. Uh, it means so much to us to uh, be able to talk about your father. Um, Maybe we'll have to get Sheila on the podcast too because I bet she has yeah. amazing war stories as well. <laughs> she, um, does. she does. I've known yeah. Sheila since I was 11, so. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well. She is, uh, Sheila's older sister, Marsha, um, uh, founded Locus with Charlie Brown. Oh, oh. Really? Yeah. Wow. So, That's Sheila, I, I knew Marsha before I knew Sheila. Because Marsha was, Mar Charlie Brown was Marsha's first husband. Mm, interesting. Huh. Yeah. Well, uh, well uh, I, yeah, I could talk to you forever. That you have so much <laughs> <amazing stories. laughs> uh, But I want to let you get back to uh, those books, especially because you got a, a Denny Agarapur book in there. And I definitely, she's one of my favorites. And so whatever yeah. book you're working on, I want to read that. You know, every single person, every single editor in the entire field rejected who kills herself, except me. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, well, she's amazing. Um, you know, I, I, I read that first, that first chapter and I said, I have to work with this person with this amazing voice. Yeah. Yeah, she's incredible. Yeah, um, she's incredible. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite uh, new writers, so I uh, really appreciate uh, I want to get you to that book so I Enjoy. can read it. Uh, <laughs> thousands of pages before that, though. Well, I know. we got to get you back to work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your time, um, and you're always welcome on Dickheads. Uh, we just really um, appreciate everything that your father did. Um, we wouldn't be here together talking about Phil K. Dick if your father hadn't published so many of his books and believed in the guy that nobody else did. Um, and uh, it's an ultimate sign of, of his genius that he was able to, to see through uh, the uncommercialness of Phil K. Dick and <laughs> continue to publish him at the clip that he did. So, Thank you. And I recommend you, yeah, I recommend talk, talk to Bob Silverberg. Yeah, um, I he was actually, you know, he was he was older than me enough that that he was conscious of what was actually happening in the field in the fifties and sixties. Well, he'll be on our list. Uh, be sure to tell him that we don't bite, and uh, we love to. He might uh, bite. Yeah, he <laughs> might. yeah, that's true. 
Uh, but, you know, every time we talk to some of the people from back in the day, I mean, uh, Barry Mulsberg had hilarious stories, and it was really cool to hear. Um, it's been know, rad. He, uh, my my yeah. father loved, loved Barry, because Barry had such a negative worldview that every time he would come in to visit my father and then leave, my father would be so elated because it would make his worldview look so much more positive. <laughs> Oh, David, that's kind of like when we hang out. Yeah. <laughs> it is kind of like when we hang out. Hey, uh, yeah, uh, Volsberg, uh, uh, was told us the story during his interview of being in the room when your father found out that Man in the High Castle won the Hugo. And uh, Barry said that your father just threw the letter down and put his heart, arms up and said, it's not even science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, back then, you know, back then, um, alternative history really wasn't considered science fiction. It's, it is, right. you know, but back then it really wasn't. Well, it has, it does go to, because that was one of the, that was his second book that he published without your father, so I'm sure that, yeah. that, uh, you know, but I don't know how much the fact that he rejected those books first played into it, but, uh, <laughs> you I'm know. sure quite a bit. I'm sure it's quite a bit. Well, uh, Betsy, it was awesome talking to you. We will uh, keep you updated. I don't know when this episode will post, but when it does, we'll let you know. And uh, thank you for coming on, Dickheads. Uh, oh, thank you. Pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, anytime. Nice meeting you guys. Nice, nice meeting, meeting you. you.